The Mexico Grand Prix lacked excitement, but it did provide another Max Verstappen victory as the Dutchman broke multiple records this past weekend. The fight for second in the Constructors' Championship is coming down to the wire as Mercedes impressed and Ferrari fell short. Fernando Alonso continues to throw shade, and will we see a race in Colombia come 2024? All this and more on Unlapped. I think it's well worth breaching the cap if that's your punishment. And it was, you meant to do, like, give, give Lewis a championship, so... Um, <laughs> yeah, just pull over and say, Lewis, it's yours, mate. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. No thanks. Well. The more of these races you get, you, you look at the calendar, you're like, where are these going to go? Mate, a bulldog right yeah, now. Yeah, I'm, I'm handing in my Ferrari membership, my Ferrari fan club membership card. I'm, this season has just done me in. Welcome to Unlapped, an ESPN F1 show. I'm Katie George, he's Lawrence Edmondson, and that's Nate Saunders. Nate, welcome back. Are you well and rested? I am, yeah. Thanks for letting me uh, have some time off to sleep last week, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, Lawrence you did that all called retrospectively. it. He knew immediately. Yeah, yeah he, he knows me too well. He was like, we haven't heard from Nate for five minutes. He's definitely sleeping. So uh, I've, also been, I've, I've also been there with the jet lag. So to give people context, Nate flew back from Austin to the UK and that jet lag is a killer. Yeah. So it can kind of, you, it wakes you up in the morning, but it also kind of takes you out at night sometimes. Because so. you, you land at nine and you're like, I've got to stay awake until at least 9 p.m., maybe later. And I have a very comfy sofa in my in my living room. So as soon as I sat on that, I was just, my eyes were gone. I was like that the gif of that baby slowly falling asleep. And I was just, yes. I was just out of it. So, uh, but yeah, much, much, much better this week. Thank no you. worries. I'm glad to hear it. Speaking of jet lag, Lawrence, how are you doing? I'm okay. Uh, cold more than anything else. It turns out the UK in November is much colder than Mexico. Who knew? But um, yeah, I'm, it's nice to be back. I've been away for about five weeks traveling and uh, it's been fun but yeah it's actually quite nice to get back home and just do normal things for a little bit now in the uk do you guys call a sweater a jumper is that 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 is true yeah yeah we we do call jumps i was actually i was wearing my icelandic jumper earlier today which is uh like this icelandic wool one because it's so cold and i haven't yet turned up the heating in my house but um it hasn't made a debut on the podcast maybe next week I dig it. I dig it. You both look great. It's good to be with you guys. Remember, if you're watching on YouTube, like this video, leave us a comment on what you want to see more of. And don't forget to subscribe to ESPN for more F1 content. And if you're listening, hit us with a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. All right, let's hit some news. Biggest news coming out of the weekend uh, certainly was Red Bull's cost cap penalty. They have now been fined $7 million and have been hit with a 10% reduction of the aerodynamic testing allowance it's entitled for the 2023 F1 season for breaking the budget cap back in 2021. When you heard the penalty, just initial reaction, initial thoughts. It was kind of what we were expecting because we knew there was going to be a financial element and we knew there was going to be a hit in aerodynamic testing. We just didn't know how much. And it's really hard to say whether it's, a fair penalty or not because unless you're an aerodynamicist it's quite hard to know what 10 percent of an already reduced amount because red bull are the champions therefore they have less testing available to them than second place even less than third place um but to give it some perspective uh, perspective it's it's around um kind of the difference between finishing first in the championship and finishing between second and third in the championship they've lost again so they will have significantly less than uh, their main rivals, Mercedes and Ferrari, going into next year, they claim as much, it's going to cost them as much as 0.25 and half a second of lap time. Um, that number seems to be quite out of whack when you turn to other, uh, talk to other engineers. They're all saying, okay. no, that's that's not the case. It's much closer to 0.1 second probably per lap. Um, and the other thing is that it's it's almost like the, the, the big gains you're going to make from your aero testing come early on so then the big concept ideas and then your kind of 10 percent at the end one engineer referred to it as the nice to haves like the the little bits that you'll tweak and change that will bring performance of course but they're not going to bring masses of performance so it's a hard one but then you've also got to look at you know what did they actually do how much did they overspend and we got the details through on that and compared to what they said they spent to what they actually spent the difference was £5.6 million, which is huge. But they also felt that they were under the budget cap by £3.8 million, which means they overspent by £1.8 million, which is 1.6% of the $145 million. Sorry for the confusion in rates, but that's just the way it all came out from the FIA um, cap at the end of it. So 
you know, a, a 1.6% over overspend, um, it's again, hard to quantify exactly what that would be, but there's lots of people that believe last year, considering how tight that championship was, mm. that is enough to bring performance to the car that could have made a big, big difference. Then there's also this tax credit that's involved. That's 1.4 million pounds. You minus that and you get down to 400,000 pounds, 0.37% overspend. And then you're looking at, well, it's still a little bit, you know, again, it was so tight last year. Maybe that was enough to push it over the edge. I think Mercedes internally seem to think that's the case. Um, so, you know, what have you got? Uh, it's a it's a penalty. It was a very transparent process. All those stats I've just given to you, all those numbers all came from the FIA. You know, they revealed everything that they could without giving the exact details of the accounts of, of Red Bull. Um, and uh, it's, it's an interesting kind of uh, resolution and, and one which I think is probably just about right. But, um, you know, in the paddock, you'll find lots of people that are saying the FIA haven't gone far enough. You'll find Red Bull saying... They've gone way too far. Christian Horner called the penalty draconian. So it's um, it's usually a case when everyone's a little bit upset. You've sure. probably got the right the right answer. But um, yeah, it's it's an interesting one. And the big question is whether it deters people from doing it in the future. Um, and and that will be interesting to see because you know if you are really close to a championship, if it's as tight as it was last year, you know a little overspend is only going to lose you ten percent down the road. You might consider that worthwhile. Yeah, I think the deterrent thing is the interesting thing going forward now, because mm -hmm. that was always going to be, I think, where the FIA had to come down on this. And Toto Wolf said, it's interesting, I, I think Toto Wolf's kind of last four weeks on this has been quite interesting, because he went from in Singapore saying one team's made a major overspend and it yeah, was very, very kind of punchy about it. And then rein that in a bit. You know, people said, where, you know, how, how would you know that, etc., uh, which is interesting. You know, Red Bull were quite frustrated by that. Uh, but he said that he said, didn't he, that the reputational damage that Red Bull's kind of uh, suffered at this point is going to be bigger for them than anything else. So I think that's true to a degree because all of the all of the coverage leading up to it was, you know, they're guilty, they're guilty, they're guilty, and it wasn't really. It was before people even knew the amount. So I think that, that was mm -hmm. quite interesting how that went down. Um, so I can kind of I can understand some of the frustration on Red Bull's part, but ultimately nine other teams, well nine nine teams, all spent within it. Aston Martin had a procedural mm -hmm. breach in it as well. Um, which effectively just means they filled out a spreadsheet slightly incorrectly when they handed that in. Um, but yeah, it, it, crazy process. I mean, Lawrence and I were kind of digging into this when we were in Austin and um, absolutely just insane, you know, the, the scale of the audit that's gone into this. And I think one thing that F1 needs from this to follow is, A, this has to be quicker going forward. I think the FIA has realized what a mammoth task that is. You can't be in October the following year and be discussing the budget cap the year before. And that's not, I think the FIA, I think Lawrence is right. From everyone we spoke to, the FIA has actually come out of this pretty well in terms of the transparency of the process, which, you know, it's, it's not often we talk positively about the FIA this season. So, mm -hmm. you know, credit where it's due there. Um, but yeah, I think that they've realized they need to, A, like make the process quicker if they can. Uh, and now we have at least a, a bit of precedent there about the penalties. But I, to go to what Lawrence said at the end of his, um, his bit there, I think... Um, some of our rivals, I think he said some of our rivals want to burn our wind tunnel down, which was just a great quote. Um, but yeah, I think it, it seemed fair and it's difficult because most people were talking for weeks and weeks and months and months, championships are going to go, points mm -hmm. are going to go. And that actually, in reality, was never really that realistic. Um, and so I think it took a life of its own on Twitter a little bit. People were like, oh, Red Bull are going to have all does. these things taken. Yeah. And really, you know, when we were talking to people there, it was like, no, it's going to be sporting, but it will be a, a future facing penalty. So uh, yeah, like like Lawrence said, what we expected. And to be honest with you, I'm quite glad it's over with because it was just four weeks of, you know, absolutely. I was just so glad when they released it. I was like, right, we can talk about this properly now and, you know, move on from it because it just become a it become a bit of a, you know, sour talking point, I think. But here's the other thing, just briefly, while we're talking about the deterrent as well, is that the FIA statement said that Red Bull didn't act in bad faith, dishonored, mm. dishonestly, or in a fraudulent manner. So they took that into account with the penalty. So if another team looks at it and they're like, oh, well, we can overspend by 1.6 million and um, so 1.6%, and we'll get away with it with just a 10% reduction. Well, that's not necessarily the case because if the FIA then looks into it, and realize that they've they've spent they spent in ways which Purposeful. they clearly knew they were going to get an advantage. Um, then uh, that's a key factor in in the penalty that's going to come out the other end. So I think that 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 element was key, and you know that is I think that's part of the FI investigation 
And what they found was that while Red Bull were, and by this is in Christian Horner's own words, aggressive with some of the ways they accounted for spending last year, um, it wasn't necessarily dishonest. I think, you know, they were pushing up to the boundaries, but without necessarily the intent to completely blow the boundaries away or find a way around it. So it's, I mean, it's it's still a really difficult, you know, even with all this information we've got from the FI, it's really still difficult to come to, to a judgment without being a forensic accountant and having everything there and knowing exactly why certain decisions were made. But Christian Horner did um, a press conference in Mexico that I attended. It went on for 50 minutes and he went through all the different points from the catering uh, to the sick pay. Um, there's a number of things which Red Bull were, were, were putting out there um, as reasons why they went over this cap. So, yeah, it's it, it's interesting. It's cleared up a lot. But what will be fascinating is what happens uh, for this year, because, of course, Red Bull, if they believe they were right in all of the ways they were kind of incorrectly accounting last year, well, presumably they've been doing that already up to now in the 2022 mm -hmm. season. So if we then get to the end of this year, we may well find that in a year where budgets have been even tighter, not just because the budget caps come down, but also because of um, inflation, rising energy costs. If we then find out that Red Bull have gone over again, it's, you know, it's, it, that's well, then you're a repeat situation. offender. Because you're mm -hmm. a repeat offender, but they didn't know a lot of these things were going to be accounted differently until now. So there's, you know, that that's another fascinating thing to get ahead around. And then also if they come in, underneath well that suggests that maybe they did slightly tailor some of the way they were accounting stuff and then perhaps knew last year they weren't so it's yeah th there's a lot going on and it, it's it's not over yet you know these, these regulations are still pretty new uh, they're actually getting tighter as i just mentioned so yeah it'll be interesting to see what comes out next year and uh whether maybe there's more than one team uh who, who have reached it but yeah we'll, we'll have to wait sadly until as they just said uh, probably September, October next year to find out. <laughs> it's just absurd, isn't it? But anyway, that's it's going it to become like the annual October talking point, isn't it? The budget cap. <laughs> it's just going to be one of those things. Just quickly to round off the point, um, one team boss told me in the lead up to Austin. So I think there are some suspicions about overspends again. One team boss said one thing the FI needs to do is have you know punishments escalate if you're a repeat offender yes. and you know have suspended sentences then and stuff like that so i think you're getting to a point now where you know if th th there's that push from other teams i think they've almost realized i i, I don't want to put words into any team boss's mouth but you get a sense that some of them might be feeling like this is potentially like a got your moment for red bull like if you have offended again we can really kind of get the faa to punish you a lot down the line so we'll see yeah almost like a sliding scale it would be mm. more severe. And I think we can agree the $7 million fine isn't as big of a deal as a 10% reduction of the aerodynamic testing. And I'm just curious, Lawrence, real quick, without going too deep in the weeds, for those who don't understand the aerodynamic testing, you know, what is that process? What is that structure set up like? Okay, so the majority of performance in a Formula 1 car comes from the aerodynamics. So it's incredibly important that teams research into how to make the fastest car, both in terms of downforce and also making it faster in a straight line, reducing drag. And so the, the two key tools for doing that is the wind tunnel, uh, which is uh, they put a scale model, 60% model in a wind tunnel, and they learn from that how the air is moving around it and whether they can add more downforce. They have sensors on it that can learn from that. And then they also have CFD, um, which allows them to do it basically with uh, you know, um, uh, simulate it on computers and mm -hmm. uh, and learn about stuff and, and kind of build new ideas. And the CFD is very rapid because you can build something without having to actually make the model and get an answer. And then the wind tunnel is usually used to verify it. And then you have your third way of kind of understanding how the car works. And that's actually running it on track. So you have those three things. The better they correlate, the more they all agree with each other, and um, the more likely you are to find performance. And of course, the more time you have uh, to play with the CFD, and to play with the wind tunnel, uh, the more ideas you can explore. And yeah. um, that has been limited for some time uh, because there was a stage when teams were basically running their wind tunnels constantly uh, and it just became very, very expensive. And um, also it just meant teams with the best wind tunnels would just disappear into the distance. So the FIA for a while had been clamping down on it. And then it was, I think a couple of years ago, they introduced this scaled um, 
I don't know, it's often been referred to in the same way as a kind of almost like a draft pick. So the, the worse you are the previous year, the more time you get in your winter. So it's more like you get your pick of, of the best players. Well, in this case, you get your extra time in the wind tunnel uh, and with CFD to, to kind of bring you higher up. Meanwhile, the teams that finish at the top have less time and therefore, in a way, a handicap to some extent. Um, of course, it's not quite as simple as that because it depends how good your CFD and wind tunnel tools, tools are. The more efficient they are in getting it right, the more performance you'll get. So even a team like Red Bull with a reduced amount um, may still be able to come up with more, you know, better solutions and bigger gains than a team running towards the back of the grid that's relying on a third-hand wind tunnel, you know, using somebody else's wind tunnel and uh, CFD tools that are a little bit out of date. So it's... Um, it, it, it's a good one and it, it, it's a good rule in F1, I think, um, this scaling thing, because it should over time level things out. And the idea being is that they're just going to slightly chop what Red Bull have got already. Interesting. So fascinating. Well, Red Bull also wasn't just in the news for the penalty that came down finally and the reaction there. Uh, they boycotted uh, certain media outlets um, in talking with certain media members and that happened to be sky sports while they were down in Mexico. And so I'm just curious from your all's vantage point, was this a long time coming, uh, in the way that maybe Red Bull felt like sky has treated Max Verstappen over time, or was this maybe a convenient classic case of deflection that you're in the news for the wrong reasons. And now you're going to put the onus back on, you know, a media member or a media outlet. I think it's a good case of both of those things, actually. I think the um, the deflection is certainly true as well. It's, it does seem like a convenient time to to boycott sure. the media. Um, there was so, you know, it, it was never really re re said by Red Bull. They never really named who it was, but everybody Did reported you... it as, as Ted Kravitz. <laughs> so from Sky. But And the thing is, is that Ted obviously does his notebook show, very, very popular on Sky, uh, and had talked about, in his Austin show had talked about uh, Lewis being robbed of the championship. It was basically saying what a Hollywood script it would have been if Lewis had been out of past max, you know, the guy who won the race where he was robbed last year. Now I think robbed is used by British people a lot differently to how it might be used. You know, we like for every two years, the English football team is robbed. For example, we just say it all the time. It's just the way we, it's just the way we do sports. Okay. Um, but I have heard through the year that there've been some frustrations at, certain coverage of of max and so, so this all really stems around abu dhabi you know it's been it's been kind of the the thing that just never goes away for red bull and um i'm sure lawrence will attest to this as well one of the things that i've got from red bull is they're quite i think they're quite baffled about how people still talk about that you know i think they're just like well you know max won it on the day and for everyone else it's like yeah but you know it wasn't the frustrating thing about last year was that max really didn't do anything wrong red bull didn't really do anything wrong at that end it, but it was it shouldn't have gone down at all because of the way it was implemented. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't care, you know, if, if it had been the other way around, Christian Horner, I think, would still be talking today about Lewis Hamilton's eighth championship not being not being worthy. I think that that would have been the case. So I think it's a valuable to a, a valued talking point. And I think that they felt that the way Sky was dealing with that was disrespectful. I've certainly heard from that. But this stems, I, I mean, we can go back to even before Abu Dhabi. I remember okay. they were frustrated by... Sky Sports spent a lot of that week beforehand, as did a lot of the media, talking about is Max going to win this championship by driving Lewis off the track? And they were appalled by that at the time. They were so annoyed by it. And to be honest with you, you can kind of understand why. They both collided during that season, but it was quite an outrageous thing to suggest. And not to throw... Like, I love I love the Autosport publication. It's one of the reasons I'm a F1 journalist because I used to read it as a kid, but they published an open letter that morning of that race, basically pleading with Max, like don't drive Lewis off the track. And I spoke to somebody at Red Bull in Austin and they referenced that letter. They said, it's, you know, this has been going on for ages. It's been going on since that letter, since everything before Abu Dhabi, you know, after Silverstone, they felt that that was 100% Lewis's fault. And everybody kind of was like, well, it was 50, 50. So I think this has been simmering away for a while, but the, probably the timing of it meant that they were like, let's boycott now. But to be honest with you, I think that that does a disservice to Max because I don't think Max thinks, thinks in that way. Red Bull collectively following him, I think they were like, this is a good opportunity to rally around Max and to to kind of it's like battening down the hatches, isn't it? It's like we're we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. But I think Max just, you know, he he is his own person. He did this with Netflix. Um so I think from his perspective, I don't think Max sits there and thinks if I do this, I'll stop talking about the budget cap. Because as far as he he's concerned, 
he's a two-time world champion. He doesn't care about either of those things happening. Sure. Uh, in, in, and I mean that in the sense of he doesn't he doesn't see them as anything to do with him. And I think that's probably fair as well. You know, if you're a driver, you get in the car, you drive it, you win races, you win championships. So I think it's a bit of both. But this definitely at Red Bull has been has been simmering away, bubbling away. And you know, sometimes I, I've you know know a lot of people at Red Bull, and I think sometimes the perception is that Lewis, especially from the British speaking media, kind of gets the you know the better treatment and that might be true you know sky is a british broadcaster after all um so i don't know it i disagree that it's been massively slanted towards lewis but i i can i can kind of see Understand. some of where red bulls come from here and um ultimately as a journalist i thought it was a great story i just was like you know it's always great when <laughs> when somebody boycotts anything because it gives us something to talk about ironically it gives us something to talk about when somebody <laughs> doesn't talk to somebody else but um yeah there's lots to it and this red bull didn't just pluck this out of a hat but i think that yeah certainly it helped them because we weren't we came out of the weekend not talking about the budget cap and talking about sky and max etc lawrence what was kind of the feeling and mood you got on the ground well, the funny thing about being on the ground is that you don't get to see the sky coverage. So <laughs> I, I haven't actually seen the, the offending uh, piece of TV reporting. Um, but yeah, it, it, it became apparent on the Saturday, which was the day after we'd learned about the budget cap stuff, uh, that Max wasn't talking to Sky Sports. And I think it included Sky Italian, Sky Germany as well. So, you know, big markets. Um, and uh you know, Max was very clear about it in, in the press conference after the race when he was asked about it, you know, just won a race and most of the questions were, were on that subject. But there was one, uh, I think, fairly and understandably about that. And, you know, he, he's genuinely upset. He said, you know, it's just this constant kind of picking away, he feels, you know, at his success and at his championship. And you can understand why someone who's devoted as much as he had, you know, as a driver, uh, again, as Nate said last year, you know you can have all your opinions about what happened in Abu Dhabi, but Max didn't actually do anything wrong. He just got the opportunity presented to him by a decision made by FIA race director Michael Massey, and he took it. You know what was he meant to do? Like give give Lewis a championship? So um, <laughs> yeah, just pull over and say, Lewis, it's yours, mate. Oh, well, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, I don't no thanks. What, I don't agree with what Michael Massey's just done. I'm I'm going to park my car. So it's yeah, it's it it's a tricky one, and and also Max, I think. You know, he's such a pure racer um, that he, I think, often just focuses entirely on that. And when there's this, you know, bigger picture stuff and things, he'll often duck out of it. But on this one, he just wanted to have his say and um, uh, decided that the best way to do it was not to talk to Sky. And apparently it's a one race thing, uh, you know, and that the, they'll be talking again in Brazil. Uh, so we'll have to see what happens. But um, it's uh, it's interesting because I, I also didn't get to watch a lot of the other... Um, broadcasts and I wouldn't understand them because most of them are in other languages but it would be interesting to know what the Dutch um, the the, uh, the Dutch coverage is like whether that's very pro-Max anti-Lewis I suspect it might be but anyway um, you know it'd be interesting to know how how far out of whack the Sky Sports version is compared to, to some of the other ones. I think the point about the Dutch media is is interesting as well so I spoke to one of the Dutch journalists Eric, Eric Van Haren who is really close with Max and actually breaks a lot of news around the Verstappen camp. You know, really, really good journalist. And he, he, we were talking about this on the Sunday morning. We were both on European time and everyone else was, I think, waking up to this story. So we were just having a quick chat about it. And he said, he's like, I totally get how media bias can form because the Dutch media, a lot of the reason there's that interest in, in the Netherlands is because of Max. And so it's natural that they will interview him. And it's a Dutch speaking thing. He's, you know, there's obviously Nick De Vries coming in next year, but there's, only one person in that paddock who drives who speaks Dutch. So it makes a lot of sense. So I think that there is that part of it as well. But just to to go back to the Abu Dhabi point and the wider point of this, I think the issue we've got to generally with social media, and this isn't just Formula One, but Formula One exemplifies it, is everyone is so entrenched in their camps now, aren't they? There's no, there's just no middle ground in terms of talking to people now. And the funny thing is, if you went back, kind of, I kind of referenced it earlier, if you flip those situations around, you'd have Lewis fans right now being like Matt, you know, Lewis is our worthy eight-time world champion. You know, he's the goat. You, you Red Bull guys are just crybabies, etc. And you'd have Red Bull saying, "No, you know, it wasn't fair what happened last year." And they wouldn't. They, th there would be no middle ground in it at all because they're like, "I'm defending my guy." And I just think the whole thing. One thing that Verstappen said is, you know, if you're if you're spreading negativity on social media, he doesn't want to be any part of it. And I think there's there's something to that. So I did actually quite respect him taking that stand. Um, interesting. There's only one race because. 
there was a suggestion that it was just indefinite. Um, obviously, he gave Netflix the silent treatment for you know a whole year and a half, um, which he's now kind of reversed as well. But again, this is what I quite respect about Max is you know he did that with Netflix, spoke to Netflix, spoke to Formula One, and said you know if you want me back on, uh, you know you don't have to pander to me, but I just want you to be a bit more honest about my portrayal. That was all he asked for. So and it sounds like he's got that. So um, yeah, it, 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 like, like I said, gave us something to talk about. Um, and it'll be interesting to see the first time Ted Kravitz gets to ask Max a question or talk about Max. I don't know whether he'll be super glowing to him or whether he'll be like looking around to make sure Red Bull aren't around. But uh, I think it will blow over. You know, this is one of the issues with race after race after race. It's just constant media, constant attention. Um, so, yeah, I think everyone needs, this, needs the off season just to go and chill out in a quiet, mm-hmm. dark room somewhere. And, and this does happen as a journalist. You'll write something or, you know, you'll report something and it's not going to please everyone. You know, the best stories yeah. don't tend to do that. Um, so, you know, you do get into situations where you have kind of quite uncomfortable conversations with press officers and so on. And you have to explain, you know, what, what why this story is the way it is and or, or why an opinion has been taken. So it's not it's not that unusual. And I, I think Nate's right about Max. The other thing is that, you know, he does tend to forgive, Like he's not, he won't hold a grudge indefinitely. And I quite like that about him. He's kind of very matter of fact. He's like, right now, you know, I don't agree with what you're saying. I'm not going to talk to you, but I'll give you another chance. And so, um, yeah, I'm sure this will all blow over. But I do think it's a unique part about this sport. And it's not just, you know, Max being outspoken about the media and his mistreatment or what he deems as mistreatment. I mean, this sport people wear emotions on their sleeves. And when a manager or team principal is not happy about something, I mean, when they sit them right next to each other, I mean, some of those team principals go at it. You know, drivers take shots at one another through the media more so than I I think I'm accustomed to maybe seeing in American sports. It certainly exists, but I don't think that sometimes athletes in the States are as outward or are willing to take a shot, which I think entices you as a fan, right? I mean, it's highly entertaining for better or worse, but I do think that this sport, people are fine wearing their emotions on their sleeves, which I enjoy as a consumer, certainly. I think that's one of the big appeals of of the Netflix series. So we saw that, you know, we really got to see behind the scenes exactly how drivers react when the journalists aren't there. Okay, the cameras were still rolling, the Netflix cameras, but they weren't quite as intrusive as, as the cameras that they normally face. Um, and then the other thing is uh, Christian Horner's whole, the way he's dealt with the budget cap saga is that he's tried to make Red Bull the victims on a number of occasions, yeah. you know, saying everybody else is labelling us cheats when we're not and all this kind of stuff. And um, and then you have to go back to the central. You're like, well, if, if Red Bull hadn't overspent, um, whether you believe that's cheating or not. But if Rebel hadn't overspent, we wouldn't be talking about this in the first place. So sometimes yeah. uh, you do need to stand back a bit, take a reality check of what is being said, not get drawn into the narratives because they can be very convincing. And just stand back and remember, one, it's a sport. And two, that you know you can have an opinion and, and it's probably going to fall somewhere in between all these very extreme opinions from these very motivated and uh, competitive teams. Nate, you reminded me, you mentioned Nick DeVries. I'm just curious, where is Haas and uh, Hulkenberg at this point in their deal? Closer, far? So it seems not as close as people might think. I was told that we won't have anything before Brazil as it stands. Um, And I think that that really speaks to the fact that um, they're just taking their time on this now. They've got no rush. There's no other seats up for grabs. You know, we know where everyone else is driving. And so I think they can just take their time on it. And I think that to Haas's credit, they've tried to give Mick as much time as possible to kind of prove whether or not he needs, you know, whether he is worth that seat or not. Um, and I think I, I quite respect that. So if they do get rid of Mick, if that is the outcome, I don't think he can turn around and complain, you know, even though this has been hanging over his head, it's like, it's been in your court this whole time and there have been ups and downs. And I think that the, I think things behind the scenes, there are a bit better. There were some frustrations and tensions earlier in the year. Um, so it, it's interesting. I think they're still leaning towards Hulkenberg, which you know people have mixed opinions on. I I would like if it was a choice for me, I'd I'd stick with Mick. I think a younger driver would be great, but I think Hulk just gives them that reliable, you know, know known quantity. Um, but I don't think it's a, it's definitely not a cert yet. So um, you know, if, hopefully they give Mick. Brazil would be, you know, a, I always associate Brazil. Brazil's one of those circuits you always associate with Michael Schumacher. Just some of his great performances there. So, you know, hopefully Mick can kind of find some magic if they do give him Brazil as well. Sprint race weekend, you know, you've got two chances to be spectacular in a race. So um, we'll see. But yeah, it looks like Hulkenberg, I'd say 60-40 right now, leaning towards him. This should come as no surprise, but the Vegas Amex tickets sold out uh, 
instantly. Everybody was clamoring for tickets. Obviously, Formula One is as popular as ever here in the United States. But there have been talks that we could possibly see an F1 race in Colombia in 2024. What do you guys think of that? I mean, I'm all in. Uh, I'd love to go to Colombia. First, from a purely selfish perspective, let's do it. Let's just. Lawrence is like, I've been gone for five weeks, so let me (laughs) get back to you on that. I'd happily add Colombia, um, especially as at the moment we've only got one race in South America in Brazil. So to mm-hmm. add Colombia there, it looks like um, Barranquilla, I think, I hope I mispronounced that, is, is the venue they're looking at, which is on the Caribbean coast. So yeah, so cool. that, sounds, that, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Um, we, we get these announcements every now and again that various places are looking or keen to hold a race and of course there are lots of places that are very keen to hold a Formula one race especially right now but um the, the money is important and the mayor said uh, there's still a lot of work to be done which i took a shorthand for um you know we're still a long way from getting a deal over the line but there are reports that stefano domenicali has gone there um f1 haven't kind of gone out of their way to to deny that so i think it's a possibility um i also heard in mexico from the promoters of the race there they actually look over uh, the Foro Sol Stadium there, which has a huge amount of music venues, and they are a much bigger promoter beyond just the Formula One race. And they were saying, well, you know what? If there's more interest of uh, of a race, uh, you know, in the South America, Central America region, let us know because we're good promoters. We know how to put on a race. Maybe we can get involved and help things happen. So, um, yeah, there was a few little rumors kind of floating around that uh, there's a possibility of, of of more races, South America. Central America, uh, who knows? But and something more around there, I think, would be really good for the sport and for people watching the US. Another race on a on a friendly time zone, so that's always good. It's kind of it's it's great that there's this interest, but it comes back to that point, doesn't it? That we've talked about before of the more of these races you get, you you look at the calendar and you're like, where are these going to go? And um, I and think is it I'm sustainable. All... Yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, it's difficult because you don't want to be someone that says we shouldn't have new races because obviously that's how a sport grows. But mm-hmm. you know the heartland of a of a championship is still the famous races people love. So I think this is uh, something F one's going to probably have to like address head on at some point. You know the the interest is fantastic. Obviously South Africa's talking about a race as well. Uh, Colombia um, would be great. I mean that's, you can imagine that being an incredible race. You know for to attract fans to go to. Um, but there's been a lot of new races that have joined the calendar recently in great places that haven't maybe been the best Sunday spectacle. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't, maybe F1's not too fussed about that right now. But yeah, we, we seem to be reaching this point at the moment that I feel like we're on the edge of a precipice of this becoming a serious issue. F1's got to kind of address head on. Um, whether I've always thought it'd be great to have rotating races. So, you know, you have a, a race in one calendar slot and it's like there's five races. We alternate between these races. Mm-hmm. I think it would actually make it great season to season you're like we haven't been here for five years we could you know you kind of forget what the circuit's like etc um and at the moment that's really the only way they're gonna they're gonna fit all of these races in because there's only 24 spots in the rules that you can have at the moment so um yeah but i mean I, i'd happily give up I'm, I'm trying to think what i'd give up for columbia maybe give up some of those there's a few on there that maybe i'd be like yeah columbia over that definitely um, there's definitely a few more than a few I would say. more than a few <laughs> willing to share right now on could, the record qatar could go um Saudi could go. I mean, Saudi could definitely go, couldn't it? Um, I'm trying to make it. I'm, I'm trying to think of one outside the Middle East. I don't want it to seem like I've just put targets in the Middle East races. Uh, I'm Lawrence... happy not go back to China. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it looks like yeah. we may not be going back to China next year anyway, immediately. Um, but yeah, I'd happily not go back there. Yeah. So there's definitely spaces, but it's just a lot of these races that we just mentioned are, are tied into incredibly long deals, just yeah. just <laughs> uh, coincidentally. So um, yeah, interesting one. Before we talk about not so great Sunday spectacles, uh, as we recap the Mexico Grand Prix, uh, last bit of news. Not sure if you saw it. Still within the world of motorsport, did you guys see Ross Chastain in NASCAR and what yeah. was done? Amazing. Like uh, I think Fernando Alonso. Is it amazing? It. I mean, Fernando Alonso knows racing better than I do, uh, and he said it was <laughs> okay. like he said it was crazy and uh, like a video game, and that is kind of. Like he put it on his Instagram and a lot of the drivers in F1 have shared it. Um, I just, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I didn't know you could do that and not destroy the car. I just wouldn't have ever thought you could. So I don't know whether uh, he knew that. I, I'm I, not I, sure I, he knew that. Yeah. I, was yeah, yeah. Say, I think it was a real kind of experimentation. And But it was one of those situations, nothing left to lose. So he just went yeah. for it. And it's kind of, it's, I think Full it's, send. It, yeah, exactly. And I think it's opened up a bit of a debate kind of, 
you know, the heart and soul of NASCAR about whether you can do that going forward. But I think we all love just that's like racing at its rawest, isn't it? It's just you go for it. And if it doesn't work, uh, I, you know, he could have looked like an <laughs> Like a complete fool if it just driven straight into the wall. Imagine if it just driven straight into the wall and the car had just been wrecked straight away. People would be like, what are you doing? And it'd been like, yeah, in my head it looked great, but it didn't, it just didn't come off. So yeah, full respect to that. It was awesome. It was you couldn't wild. do it. In, couldn't do it in a Formula One car, sadly, uh, in the same way. I would hope not. I would hope to never see that. Um, but it did get NASCAR obviously trending uh for a variety of reasons because it was such a wild video to watch, no doubt. All right, let's recap the weekend that was, shall we? So I don't want to necessarily say that it was a snooze fest, um, but I'll let you guys describe it. And I know that we've hit a bunch of news uh, that was as well. So with us not keeping people for more than an hour, I'll just toss it up to you. What stood out? What were your main takeaways from the weekend in Mexico? I think we can say snooze fest before Lawrence starts. Snooze fest is fine. Okay, I think that was fair. But yeah, it, it it was it was close to being good. It just came down to because uh, Mercedes were competitive, so it was close to having a, a a genuinely exciting race. But Mercedes got the strategy wrong. Simple as that. They misread the way the tires would perform. Uh, had they been on a strategy similar to Red Bulls or even a medium soft strategy, which is one that worked so well for Daniel Ricciardo then uh, it could have been a very different race and it could have been a closer race. But yeah, uh, unfortunately, that wasn't the case. And you were like, come on, Max, you've got to make a second pit stop to make this exciting. Because I mean, <laughs> Max still, even with a second pit stop, Max would have had a shot of victory, no doubt about it. You're like, come on, you know, that would, wouldn't that be great? Lewis v. Max going for the win. And then as the lap ticks away, you're like, oh, actually, that's not going to happen, is it? There's no way that's going to happen. Uh, it's Rippen like three times now this year this. where we're yeah. like, Max v. Lewis again, it just hasn't happened. Yeah, and you know, and it's it's also a sign of just how good Red Bull are operationally at the moment. Just everything is is nailed down. And at the start of the race, you know, I think if you talk to all the strategists, it was a bit of a there was a bit of a risk there in what they were trying to do, but they stuck to what they thought was going to happen. They had a few kind of get out clauses potentially by either bringing in a second pit stop or putting on the hards at the second at the first stop, and uh, they didn't even either. They just stuck their guns and went for it. So that was impressive. Just to shout out to Max as well, you know, what we were talking earlier about disrespects, but one thing that's amazing about that performance with Max is a few people, I think um, Tommy from WTF1 pointed this out, so I don't want to steal the steal the credit from him, but he saw the lap times of Verstappen. And if you look at Verstappen's lap times, he's on Red Bull said to him, do a 122. Mm-hmm. If you actually see Max's times throughout that stint, it just shows you why Max is as good as he is. He is so good at just that relentless pressure. You know, he's within... He's within a couple of tenths every single lap of where he needs of where the team needs him to be to get that strategy. So as frustrating and as boring as it was, it was one of those races that a lot of the times it's very easy to overlook. But the reason it was boring for the large part was because of Verstappen. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and Lewis made a lot of races like that when he was dominating. I think, I'm sure Vettel did, I'm sure Schumacher did. And it's kind of one of the things that Drive to Survive doesn't show so much, I guess, is that when a driver's dominant, you get a few more boring races because ultimately they're right out the front, they're just doing their thing. Um, but I think it was one of the worst races from an entertainment spectacle. But if you're talking about some of Max's best performances, there's a lot of ways to come through the field this year. But that one stands out as just completely in a different league to everyone else, I think. It was his 14th win of the season, beating Michael Schumacher and Vettel's record. It was his fourth Mexico Grand Prix win in five years. And he now has 416 drivers championship points, which beats Lewis previous record of 413. So I, I don't know how you get more and dominant than that. And he's only 25 and he's yeah. seven races away from Senna on the all time list. He's two time world champ. I know statistics are a bit warped now because there's more mm-hmm. races and stuff, but statistics are what they are. Um, you know, we said it a lot during the Lewis spell, like we're just witnessing like a great an all time great, I think in the future we'll look at him like that um so yeah scary times i hope i just hope for f1's sake the other teams are closer because otherwise we're going to get used to i mean we joke don't we at the end of all these pods we're not going to predict max winning anymore but if you don't do that it's just it's not it's not very good for your career prospects to, <laughs> to start <laughs> no. saying that max isn't going to win because he's no, just he's just on a different not. level so and we all like working together but i do think it's it's interesting Lawrence. you brought this up You know, Ferrari, I think all things considered, had a disappointing weekend. Carlos Sainz finished in fifth. Charles Leclerc finished sixth. Uh, You know, Mercedes is 
nipping at the hills, maybe of you could say a Ferrari in the constructors championship, but you know, Mattia pointed out afterwards, you know, we're always getting ripped for our strategy. Why isn't Mercedes held to the same kind of standard? And you mentioned the tire strategy and the miss that Mercedes had in, in this Grand Prix. Do you think that's fair that Mercedes maybe isn't called out or as media isn't as critical of Mercedes as they have been of Ferrari this season? I think everyone that watched that race, you know, realized that Mercedes had made a mistake. So, and I think it was said, I mean, I've, certainly wrote about it. So I'm not sure Matias has got a, a great point there. The other factor being is that when Ferrari were making the mistakes, the championship was still very much on. They had a car that was consistently as competitive, if not more competitive than Red Bull. And they threw away a bunch of opportunities, whereas Mercedes are coming back with a car that has been hugely uncompetitive relative to the front two for most of the year and are now getting the odd shot at it and are taking gambles on strategy as well. So it's kind of a bit more understandable why Mercedes would be making these mistakes than why Ferrari was at the start of the year. So, yeah, I think he's got a point, but um, it's also one of those things that it's just how difficult it is to beat a team like Red Bull that, as I just said, you know, so operationally spot on. Um, how do you do that? So, uh, but, you know, Ferrari were off the pace in, um, uh, in Mexico and that's partly down to um their engine design they have a smaller turbocharger which at that altitude has to spin even faster to get the air into the engine and so that kind of left them down on power they then had to tweak uh, other parts of the setup to reduce drag to try and keep a decent top speed and then that led to other issues so it was a really bad weekend for ferrari in many ways so i think maybe talk about deflection earlier maybe there's a, there a little bit of that from material but <laughs> i think ferrari could have told you going into that race weekend just because of physics essentially and racing at that altitude 2250 meters um they were always going to be off the pace so um maybe it was a bit of that uh and uh i hope that ferrari are kind of back in a bit more for, for, for the final two races of the year because really what we want to see next year and we might not get it because Red Bull do look so good at the moment. But what we want for next year is those three teams, ideally more if any can join, all fighting for the championship. So it'll make it a lot more exciting to watch. Nate, you're shaking your head. <laughs> I just thought, I think it was fair from Lawrence, but I think he was a bit too kind on Ferrari in terms of, you know, the beset, you know, I think the, the reason people find those, I find whenever I hear Bonotto say that, or Carlos Sainz said it a few times this year, the reason people don't hold Mercedes to the same standard as Ferrari is because Ferrari haven't won the last seven championships or eight championships in a row. You know, they haven't won for so long. We've got so used to them just, you know, messing up. The story of the season's been they haven't been good enough. So when I hear Bonotto say that, it I just it really frustrates me because there's a reason that we focus more on Ferrari doing that. It's because that's that's their kind of MO at the moment. They've been doing it for years. You know, something at Ferrari, every race seems to be wrong. And I include the drivers in that as well. You know, the drivers have have let the team down a few times this season as well. So yeah. That's why if Mattia Bonotto is by any chance listening to this or there's Ferrari fans listening to it who don't know why people don't hold Mercedes to the same account as Ferrari, you just have to turn a few pages back in the history books to look at it. I think Mercedes have earned a little bit of leeway when it comes to them. And we do, to be fair, I think when Mercedes made big mistakes when they were winning, they got absolutely roasted in the media. You know, mm -hmm. the, 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 key, the, the key difference with Mercedes was they always came back and then they won the next race or they won the next 10 races or whatever. Ferrari don't seem to do that. They just seem happy to kind of, you know, complain that the media is not being fair to them. And I don't think that's fair at all because, you know, we should, I know Red Bull seem to have pulled away from Ferrari a lot this year, but it should have been so much closer and that's all on Ferrari. So you can't, you can't say we haven't been giving them a fair shake of the stick because we have. Nate, a bulldog right yeah, now. I'm, I'm handing in my Ferrari membership, my Ferrari fan club membership card. I'm, this season has just done me in. I can't Let's do it anymore. <laughs> Let's spin it. Don't go to a dark place just yet. Let's spin this positively. Daniel Ricardo, after what was a very emotional post-race interview in Austin, finished mm. seventh, even with a 10-second penalty. I, I was shocked by it. I don't want to say shocked. I was happy to see the performance that he put together on Sunday. It was it's also frustrating because well, it's also frust frustrating because you know you, you see the guy's still good enough. He's mm. still got the potential fair. and Part of it was down to strategy. Okay, his move on Sonoda was was clumsy, but the raw pace was there. And you're like, come on, Daniel, where's that been for yeah. so oh, long? And it's, it it's seems a bit, like a bit like Monza last year. You know, just, he can do it, but yeah. he just can't do it consistently. Why not? Does, I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. 
it does seem with Ricardo. I don't know if there's something to this, but you know, Monza that he qualified well, got into the into lead turn one, and then he would have at one point come past Max's car, sat on top of Lewis, and I think he said afterwards that kind of kicked him into another gear. And I think the collision with Sonoda and and just the penalty he got, and probably thinking like, ah, oh, you know, I should be on for a good result here. So like it almost kicked him into into gear a little bit. Mm-hmm. It, suddenly, you know, Lawrence is right. We suddenly saw this Danny Rick, and I always say to fan, you know, newer fans of Formula One, like. Back in his day, Danny Ricardo was, you know, he was brilliant. Yeah, every every race, especially at Red Bull, you know, he would be one of the guys if the car was good enough, he could win the race. So it was great to see that. Obviously, it's far too late to save his kind of time at McLaren. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad we didn't just see him kind of going off into, a, you know, into whatever the future holds for him without a performance like that. You know, he's got two more races to to do something. But I did hear someone say something that I think is fair is – you can't start turning up to the paddock on a Thursday on a horse or whatever it is and then underperform like you do in Austin. You know, I really like Daniel Ricciardo. He's one of my favorite drivers, best people to talk to in F1. But perception's a huge thing, you know, and I think it's good yeah. that people got to see that he can still drive and he still knows what he's doing. So, yeah, brilliant. And I deserved – well, I think people were confused that you could kind of get a 10-second penalty and be driver of the day, but there was not much else going on in that race. So I think he kind of won it by no, default, but also it was good to see. So, yeah, awesome. One last point that I I wanted to ask you both about, you know, Fernando Alonso, as we mentioned at the top of the show, uh, tried to diminish, I think, Lewis Hamilton's success as of late going into the weekend. Uh, And then he seemed pretty frustrated, um, you know, with the DNF due to mechanical issues. And, you know, he made some poignant comments about his um, current team. Uh, Just where do you feel like he's at and is the frustration uh, warranted at this point? I think a key point you made there is current team is that mm-hmm. he's on the way out of that team. And it's amazing how honest drivers will become uh, about their situation <laughs> yeah. when they know they're going to a different team and somebody else can be paying them the following year. So I think that's part of it. But he's right. Like If you look at Fernando's results this year, I saw somebody compile it on um, Instagram and put it in a post. And some of them are quite small, marginal, but they all add up. And some of them are huge. And he has lost a lot of points. I think, you know, if he finishes behind Ocon this year, he's currently behind him, his teammate in the championship. Uh, I don't think that's a fair reflection of how those two drivers have been or how good those two drivers are. So um, I get the frustration from Fernando's uh, point of view. I do wonder whether it will be eased at all uh, Aston Martin next year. But, you know, I, I hope that he can click into, into there. But we also have this thing, you know, with him saying that, Max's championships are worth more than Lewis's and, you know, uh, Max is worth more than Michael's. There's, there's always this world according to Fernando Alonso. <laughs> and it's uh, yeah, yeah. It, from, from the world that I see, from the one and the races that I see, there is always a slight departure. But you, you often get his point, but you don't necessarily agree with him. You know, that's, that's where I feel with Fernando. But on the, on the whole kind of reliability issues and the Alpine not doing what it should do on a number of occasions, that's actually quite hard to argue. Yeah, I think I f- f- Lawrence and I talk about Fernando Alonso all the time when we're driving into circuits. Like I think he's fantastic for for F1 for this exact reason. You know, if you were to say who are the three best drivers in F1, I'd say it's him, Max, and Lewis. So I think it's okay. you know he should be up there in a better car. It's his fault he's not. I think we've talked about that before. Kind of some of the mistakes he's made and stuff. Um, but you need characters like this. I don't always agree with what he says, and I think that he's got this interesting trait right now. He'll say something very provocative and he immediately backtracks and says, no, people misunderstood me. You know, he said, and they see a few of them are aimed at Lewis. You know, there was Belgium Mm -hmm. when he crashed with Lewis. You know, it was it was pretty clumsy move from Lewis. But Alonso said, this guy can only race out in front. And then two hours later, he's out of the car and he's saying, no, I didn't mean it like that. And I gave him the benefit of the doubt that time because I think radio radio quotes can be heat at the moment. They don't quite think about what they say. But this one, he was sat down with the Dutch media. He knew what he was saying. He knew it would. Well, maybe he didn't, but he should by now know that it's going to get to the wide, you know, it's going to get to the wider, the wider internet, the wide, you know, social media, etc. Um, and yeah, he he's a fascinating guy because he, I think he likes to craft his own narratives. You know, he likes to, he he thinks if I say this, everyone's going to believe what I, you know, what I think. Um, I think next year actually, I think that's one of the stories I'm looking forward to the most. Him having to be nice to the teammate who is the the son of the guy paying him all this money to drive at Aston Martin because traditionally. Uh, Alonso likes to kind of jab at his teammate where he can and just do them down ever so slightly to elevate himself. I don't think he's done it so much with Ocon this year, but if you look at what 
where he used to say alongside Van Dorn at McLaren, for example, mm. it was savage. He'd be like, this guy's meant to be brilliant and I'm absolutely wiping the floor with him. What's going on? Which sounded like a compliment until you read it and wrote <laughs> it down. And, you know, it absolutely destroyed Van Dorn. You know, Alonso absolutely destroyed Van Dorn just kind of across the board. So um, I'm really looking forward to that for this exact reason. But I think, yeah, because if he's, if he's upset now, he's going to have to drive that Aston Martin around next year. And I don't think it's the best car. So, um, but yeah, I thought the Lewis comments were, out of line but lewis responded to him in, in in credit to him pretty well you know he didn't he didn't rise to the bait and i think he's getting a bit i think he finally he said didn't he? he said he had to giggle at it i think was the, the exact quote yeah, so he clearly giggled. doesn't care too much yeah which is what a lot of us did i think so yeah shared reaction just across formula one get some rest as always i appreciate you both back in action on november 13th with brazil grand prix Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you're watching, if you're listening, remember, like this video, leave us a comment of what you want to hear and learn more about. Don't forget to subscribe to ESPN for more F1 content. And if you're listening, of course, hit us with a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. Gentlemen, cheers. Thanks. <laughs>